Yes. Listen, I, I, you know, I, this might seem like a strange way to start this, but, but I'm going to tell you anyway. When I was a kid, uh, I was given my first car for my 15th birthday. And it was a 55 Chevy. That was pretty cool. Now, one of the things that didn't work was the heat. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like riding around in an ice cold car. <laughs> and we figured out that all it was was the switch. So we put in a new panel of switches. Now, the fan worked. The heater worked. It just needed power. And the battery was good, so it had the power. But if the wires weren't connected, the fan couldn't blow. And even though the heater worked and the power was there, you drive around seeing your breath. All we had to do was make the right connection. And church, so it is when it comes to our giving. We need to make the right connection. And God has made a way. He really has. He's made a way. And, and listen, it's all about choosing what world we're going to live in and the laws of what world we'll obey. Listen to what Jesus said. He said this, he prayed this to his father. And in John 17 and 14, in the New Living Translation, he said, I have given them your word. And the world hates them because they do not belong to this world, just as I do not belong to the world. <laughs> Church, we need that kind of revelation about our true citizenship. Amen. What world do we really belong to? Amen. And then we need to possess a willingness to accept the preeminence of God's ways. Mm -hmm. Amen. And we need to accept that preeminence if we're to successfully navigate through this life by kingdom principles. Mm -hmm. Amen. One such principle is given. Now, giving needs some clarification. There are two biblical principles of giving. There's the tithe, and then there's the offering. And, and these two are very often confused, both in practice and in principle. Now, let me get to the differences. Hmm? between the tithe and the offering. We're really going to talk primarily today about the tithe. There are many today that would actually argue, in fact, if you go on the internet, go on Google and put in tithe, and you'll find 10 to 1 articles saying the tithe is a bunch of nonsense. And they're written by people that just don't want to give. And, and listen, I, I want you to know this. I don't know one faithful tither that's not blessed. That's all I can tell you. What I'm telling you today, what I'm going to share with you today, is God's way of blessing you. Yes. The connection's got to be made, just like between the, the battery and the heater. Everything can be there. All the components can be there, but if they're not connected, it's not going to happen. Church, there are many today that say, well, oh, under the new covenant, it's, you know, we just have to give as we see fit. And we have to be able to do it cheerfully. Well, upon close examination of those verses, it isn't true. Now, when it comes to the time, it's not. You see, those verses have nothing to do with the tithe and nothing to do with the general offering. They have nothing.
nothing to do with the support of the church. But instead, that's basically mentioned in two different places, both in letters of Paul to the church at Corinth, and they have to do with the church having a special offering to feed the needy believers in Jerusalem. They were under terrible stress and situations in Jerusalem. People were starving. And Paul wanted to receive special offerings for them so they could eat. In 1 Corinthians 16 and 1, Paul writes, Now concerning the collection for the saints, lay money aside as God has prospered you. This isn't the tithe. The Amplified says, Now concerning the money contributed for the relief of the saints, Again, this isn't the tithe. In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 1, and also 5 through 7. In verse 1, he says, Now concerning the ministering to the saints, it's superfluous for me to write to you. This is stupid. I don't have to do this. You know this already. Verse 5. Therefore, I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of time and prepare your generous gift beforehand, which you had previously promised. Listen, that it may be ready as a matter of generosity and not as a grudging obligation. Paul says, listen, I'm t I told you well in advance that we were going to receive a special offering for our starving brothers and sisters in Jerusalem. And I did it so that when that time came, that I said, okay, we're going to have a special offering, there wouldn't be moans and groans in the audience. So you have it already set aside, and you can give it and be blessed. And here's proof that that kind of giving mindset will bring blessings. This is where the word says, but I say, but this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now, here's what some quote in an effort to try to justify not tithing. Verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly or of necessity. God loves a cheerful giver. God doesn't want you feeling as though you're being worked over for the good of hungry Christians. He's receiving a special offering. Paul was simply urging the people to put it aside in advance. Listen, if you want to give a hundred dollars to, to, to that kind of an offering, it's a lot easier to put twenty dollars a week away for five weeks than it is to figure out where the hundred's coming from on the fifth Sunday. And Paul stated that if they did, did this faithfully and with the right heart, they were going to be blessed for it. Church, these offerings had nothing to do with the support of the church. That's what the tithe is all about. The support of the church is the purpose of the tithe. Friends, God, listen, God created nothing that he didn't plan to sustain. Did you hear me? That's like leaving on a 500 mile trip, but only having enough gas for 200 miles. And then blaming the car when it runs out. Amen. God created nothing, nothing that he didn't plan to sustain. Now, I want you to follow me for a second as we talk about where the times begin. The tithe really began in Genesis chapter 14. And in Genesis 14, you'll see Abram. This is before Abraham had his name extended. <laughs> he was then called Abram. And Abram had a nephew named Lot. And Lot lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. Nice neighborhood. Well, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah got together with some other kings to defend themselves against an invasion. 
of these five nations that were coming against them. Well, sure enough, they invaded and they defeated Sodom and Gomorrah and these other nations. And then they took everything. They took all the wealth of all these cities and all the wealth of the people and took some of the people as slaves. And in fact, they took Lot. Lot was loaded. Lot had a lot of guilt. So they took Lot, his wife, his kids, his livestock, everything Lot had. Well, this didn't sit too well with Abram. Abram was the richest man in the land. So rich was Abram that the word says that he went out after those kings and their armies and he took with him 318 trained servants from his household. Now, those were men. Sorry, ladies. Those were men, and they were men that were trained as warriors. So that means there were some servants that weren't trained. And then there was women servants. Can you imagine how many servants Abram had? That's how loaded he was. He took these 318 warriors, and out they went. And sure enough, they whooped these kings, and they took back all the wealth of all these cities, they rescued Lot and his wife and his kids and all his goods. And they came back to be greeted by a priest named Melchizedek. And what did Melchizedek do? He handed Abram an offering envelope. No, he didn't. That was a joke, but only Gwen got it. <laughs> Melchizedek prayed a blessing over him. And out of gratitude to the man of God and the God he served, Abraham said, you know what? I'm going to give you one-tenth of all the spots. Now remember, he came back with all the wealth of all these cities. He came back with like almost unimaginable Wealth and goods and spoils. He said, I'm going to give one-tenth of all this to you. Why? Because I want to. It wasn't, no one asked him for it. It wasn't required of him. He gave it willingly. Church, this was the first time. It was one-tenth. Why one-tenth? Because that's what God put on his heart. Now, this became the model, God's model for the support and the sustenance of the house of God. Notice the money was given to a priest. Who is a priest? The man of God. This was done for the support and the sustenance of the house of God. And now I want you to see, are you familiar with what the tabernacle was? The tabernacle was a portable house of God. It was a tent, big tent. I stood on the ground where the, where the tent was in Shiloh. Pretty cool place. Now looking at the tabernacle in the wilderness or the house of God, we understand that it was there to serve the people of God. It was there to serve the people of Israel. And we see described in the word in Numbers 26, which we're about to get into, we see God's plan for sustaining and maintaining both the tabernacle and his priest. So if you join me in Numbers chapter 26, I'm going to be reading from the New Living Translation. And I'm going to bounce around just a little bit. I'm going to read verses 1 and 2 first. It says, after the plague had ended, the Lord said to Moses and to Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, from the whole community of Israel, record the names of all the warriors by families. List all the men 20 years old or older who are able to go to war. 
God wanted a census. In verse 51 now, it says, in summary, the registered troops of all Israel numbered 601,730. <clears throat> That's how many men were trained for war that were over 20 years old. Can you imagine how many Israelites there were? Now the Lord wanted the Levites and their families to be numbered. And in verse 62 it says, The men from the Levite clans who were one month old or older, <clears throat> excuse me, numbered 23,000. But the Levites were not included. Listen, this is very important. The Levites were not included in the registration of the rest of the people of Israel because, listen, they were not given an allotment of land when it was divided amongst the Israelites. Go back for a second. When the people of Israel inherited the promised land, everybody was given land. Everybody in Israel was given land. Every family was given a plot of land. Some of them very large. Except for the Levites and their families. They got no land. Interesting, isn't it? Now, why did God want this census? Why did he need these numbers? Why did he need to know that there were 601,730 young men? Maybe because they generally provided the support for their household. And why do you need to know how many Levites there were? Because they're the ones that needed support. They were the ones that were chosen by God to serve the 601,000. They weren't just the priests. Levites and priests are two different things. Priests come from the tribe of Levi. They're all descendants of Aaron. If you're not a descendant of Aaron, the priest, you're not going to be a priest. And priests only come from that tribe of Levi. But not all Levites were priests. You follow that? Levites performed certain religious duties. And actually they served the priests. But they were also teachers. They were also politicians. Priests, on the other hand, offered sacrifices and represented the people before God. Now, from these verses in Numbers, we've learned that both the priests and the Levites would not receive any inheritance of land as the others did. Instead, one-tenth Of all that was given to the 601,730 would be given to the Levites. Listen, it tells us this in Numbers 18, 20 and 21. It says, And the Lord said to Aaron, Your priests will receive no allotment of land or share of property among the people of Israel. He said, I am your share and your allotment. How's that? Verse 21, as for the tribe of Levi, your relatives, I will compensate them for their service in the tabernacle. So, serving the people of God is worthy of compensation, he said. Instead of an allotment of land, listen, I will give them the tithes from the entire land of Israel. 